Welcome back to IELTS Listening Practice Session with Banke. Make sure that you read the instructions carefully, listen once only, and try not to miss any answer in this part. All right? And ensure that you write your answers in uppercase because you will not be there to explain to the examiner if he or she cannot see what you've written. Read the instructions and aim for a 10 over 10. All the best! Part 4. You will hear an anthropology student giving a presentation on spiral path designs known as labyrinths. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Labyrinths have existed for well over 4,000 years. Labyrinths and labyrinthine symbols have been found in regions as diverse as modern-day Turkey, Ireland, Greece and India. There are various designs of labyrinth, but what they all have in common is a winding spiral path which leads to a central area. There is one starting point at the entrance, and the goal is to reach the central area. Finding your way through a labyrinth involves many twists and turns, but it's not possible to get lost, as there is only one single path. In modern times, the word labyrinth has taken on a different meaning, and is often used as a synonym for a maze. A maze is quite different, as it is a kind of puzzle with an intricate network of paths. Mazes became fashionable in the 15th and 16th centuries in Europe and can still be found in the gardens of great houses and palaces. The paths are usually surrounded by thick, high hedges so that it's not possible to see over them. Entering a maze usually involves getting lost a few times before using logic to work out the pattern and find your way to the centre and then out again. There are lots of dead ends and paths which lead you back to where you started. The word maze is believed to come from a Scandinavian word for a state of confusion. This is where the word amazing comes from. Labyrinths, on the other hand, have a very different function. Although people now often refer to things they find complicated as labyrinths, this is not how they were seen in the past. The winding spiral of the labyrinth has been used for centuries as a metaphor for life's journey. It served as a spiritual reminder that there is purpose and meaning to our lives and helped to give people a sense of direction. Labyrinths are thought to encourage a feeling of calm and have been used as a meditation and prayer tool in many cultures over many centuries. The earliest examples of the labyrinth spiral pattern have been found carved into stone from Sardinia to Scandinavia, from Arizona to India to Africa. In Europe, these spiral carvings date from the late Bronze Age. The Native American Pima tribe wove baskets with a circular labyrinth design that depicted their own cosmology. In ancient Greece, the labyrinth spiral was used on coins around 4,000 years ago. Labyrinths made of mosaics were commonly found in bathhouses, villas and tombs throughout the Roman Empire. In Northern Europe, there were actual physical labyrinths designed for walking on. These were cut into the turf or grass, usually in a circular pattern. The origin of these walking labyrinths remains unclear, but they were probably used for fertility rites 
which may date back thousands of years. Eleven examples of turf labyrinths survive today, including the largest one at Saffron Walden, England, which used to have a large tree in the middle of it. More recently, labyrinths have experienced something of a revival. Some believe that walking a labyrinth promotes healing and mindfulness, and there are those who believe in its emotional and physical benefits, which include slower breathing and a restored sense of balance and perspective. This idea has become so popular that labyrinths have been laid into the floors of spas, wellness centres and even prisons in recent years. A pamphlet at Colorado Children's Hospital informs patients that walking a labyrinth can often calm people in the midst of a crisis. And apparently, it's not only patients who benefit. Many visitors find walking a labyrinth less stressful than sitting in a corridor or waiting room. Some doctors even walk the labyrinth during their breaks. In some hospitals, patients who can't walk can have a paper finger labyrinth brought to their bed. The science behind the theory is a little sketchy, but there are dozens of small-scale studies which support claims about the benefits of labyrinths. For example, one study found that walking a labyrinth provided short-term calming, relaxation and relief from anxiety for Alzheimer's patients. So what is it about labyrinths that makes their appeal so universal? You will hear a lecturer on a languages course talking about the impact of digital technology on Icelandic, the native language of Iceland. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Right, everyone. Let's make a start. Over the past few sessions, we've been considering the reasons why some world languages are in decline. And today I'm going to introduce another factor that affects languages and the speakers of those languages, and that's technology, and in particular, digital technology. In order to illustrate its effect, I'm going to focus on the Icelandic language, which is spoken by around 321,000 people, most of whom live in Iceland, an island in the North Atlantic Ocean. The problem for this language is not the number of speakers, even though this number is small, nor is it about losing words to other languages, such as English. In fact, the vocabulary of Icelandic is continually increasing, because when speakers need a new word for something, they tend to create one, rather than borrowing from another language. All this makes Icelandic quite a special language. It's changed very little in the past millennium, yet it can handle 21st century concepts related to the use of computers and digital technology. Take, for example, the word for web browser. This is Vafri in Icelandic, which comes from the verb to wander. I can't think of a more appropriate term because that's exactly what you do mentally when you browse the internet. Then there's an Icelandic word for podcast, which is too hard to pronounce, and so on. Icelandic, then, is alive and growing, but, and it's a big but, young Icelanders spend a great deal of time in the digital world, and this world is predominantly English. Think about smartphones. They didn't even exist until comparatively recently. But today, young people use them all the time to read books, watch TV or films, 
play games, listen to music and so on. Obviously, this is a good thing in many respects because it promotes their bilingual skills. But the extent of the influence of English in the virtual world is staggering and it's all happening really fast. For their parents and grandparents, the change is less concerning because they already have their native speaker skills in Icelandic. But for young speakers, well, the outcome is a little troubling. For example, teachers have found that playground conversations in Icelandic secondary schools can be conducted entirely in English, while teachers of much younger children have reported situations where their classes find it easier to say what is in a picture using English rather than Icelandic. The very real and worrying consequence of all this is that the young generation in Iceland is at risk of losing its mother tongue. Of course, this is happening to other European languages too. But while internet companies might be willing to offer, say, French options in their systems, it's much harder for them to justify the expense of doing the same for a language that has a population the size of a French town, such as Nice. The other drawback of Icelandic is the grammar, which is significantly more complex than in most languages. At the moment, the tech giants are simply not interested in tackling this. So, what is the Icelandic government doing about this? Well, large sums of money are being allocated to a language technology fund that it is hoped will lead to the development of Icelandic-sourced apps and other social media and digital systems. But clearly this is going to be an uphill struggle. On the positive side, they know that Icelandic is still the official language of education and government. It has survived for well over a thousand years, and the experts predict that its future in this nation-state is sound and will continue to be so. However, there's no doubt that it's becoming an inevitable second choice in young people's lives. This raises important questions. When you consider how much of the past is tied up in a language, will young Icelanders lose their sense of their own identity? Another issue that concerns the government of Iceland is this. If children are learning two languages through different routes, neither of which they are fully fluent in, will they be able to express themselves properly? Part 4. You will hear a zoology student giving a presentation on bird migration. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Scientists believe that a majority of the Earth's bird population migrate in some fashion or other. Some travel seasonally for relatively short distances, such as birds that move from their winter habitats in lowlands to mountaintops for the summers. Others, like the Arctic tern, travel more than 25,000 miles seasonally between the northern and southern poles. Bird migration has been studied over many centuries through a variety of observations. But until relatively recently, where birds went to in the winter was considered something of a mystery. The lack of modern science and technology led to many theories that we now recognise as error-filled and even somewhat amusing. Take hibernation theory, for example. 2,000 years ago, it was commonly believed that when birds left an area, they went underwater to hibernate in the seas and oceans. 
Another theory for the regular appearance and disappearance of birds was that they spent winter hidden in mud till the weather changed and food became abundant again. The theory that some birds hibernate persisted until experiments were done on caged birds in the 1940s, which demonstrated that birds have no hibernation instinct. One of the earliest naturalists and philosophers from ancient Greece was Aristotle, who was the first writer to discuss the disappearance and reappearance of some bird species at certain times of year. He developed the theory of transmutation, the seasonal change of one species into another by observing red starts and robins. He observed that in the autumn, small birds called red starts began to lose their feathers, which convinced Aristotle that they changed into robins for the winter and back into red starts in the summer. These assumptions are understandable given that this pair of species are similar in shape but are a classic example of an incorrect interpretation based on correct observations. The most bizarre theory was put forward by an English amateur scientist, Charles Morton, in the 17th century. He wrote a surprisingly well-regarded paper, claiming that birds migrate to the moon and back every year. He came to this conclusion as the only logical explanation for the total disappearance of some species. One of the key moments in the development of migration theory came in 1822, when a white stork was shot in Germany. This particular stork made history because of the long spear in its neck, which incredibly had not killed it. Everyone immediately realised this spear was definitely not European. It turned out to be a spear from a tribe in Central Africa. This was a truly defining moment in the history of ornithology because it was the first evidence that storks spend their winters in sub-Saharan Africa. You can still see the arrow stork in the zoological collection of the University of Rostock in Germany. People gradually became aware that European birds moved south in autumn and north in summer, but didn't know much about it until the practice of catching birds and putting rings on their legs became established. Before this, very little information was available about the actual destinations of particular species and how they travelled there. People speculated that larger birds provided a kind of taxi service for smaller birds by carrying them on their backs. This idea came about because it seemed impossible that small birds, weighing only a few grams, could fly over vast oceans. This idea was supported by observations of bird behaviour, such as the harassment of larger birds by smaller birds. The development of bird ringing by a Danish schoolteacher, Hans Christian Cornelius Mortensen, made many discoveries possible. This is still common practice today and relies upon what is known as recovery. This is when ringed birds are found dead in the place they have migrated to and identified. Huge amounts of data were gathered in the early part of the 20th century and for the first time in history, people understood where birds actually went to in winter. In 1931, an atlas was published showing where the most common species of European birds migrated to. More recent theories about bird migration vary widely. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four.
part four. You will hear a presentation by a food science student about the production of maple syrup. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Hello, everyone. Today we're going to look at another natural food product, and that's maple syrup. What is this exactly? Well, maple syrup looks rather like clear honey, but it's not made by bees. It's produced from the plant fluid or sap. Inside the maple tree, and that makes maple syrup a very natural product. Maple syrup is a thick, golden, sweet-tasting liquid that can be bought in bottles or jars and poured onto foods such as waffles and ice cream, or used in the baking of cakes and pastries. It contains no preservatives or added ingredients. And it provides a healthy alternative to refined sugar. Let's just talk a bit about the maple tree itself, which is where maple syrup comes from. So, there are many species of maple tree, and they'll grow without fertilizer in areas where there's plenty of moisture in the soil. However, they'll only do this if another important criterion is fulfilled. Which is that they must have full or partial sun exposure during the day and very cool nights, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. There are only certain parts of the world that provide all these conditions. One is Canada, and by that I mean all parts of Canada, and the other is the northeastern states of North America. In these areas. The climate suits the trees perfectly. In fact, Canada produces over two thirds of the world's maple syrup, which is why the five-pointed maple leaf is a Canadian symbol and has featured on the flag since 1964. So, how did maple syrup production begin? Well, long before Europeans settled in these parts of the world. The indigenous communities had started producing maple sugar. They bored holes in the trunks of maple trees and used containers made of tree bark to collect the liquid sap as it poured out. As they were unable to keep the liquid for any length of time, they didn't have storage facilities in those days. They boiled the liquid by placing pieces of rock that had become scorching hot from the sun. Into the sap, they did this until it turned into sugar, and they were then able to use this to sweeten their food and drinks. Since that time, improvements have been made to the process, but it has changed very little overall. So, let's look at the production of maple syrup today. Clearly, the maple forests are a valuable resource in many Canadian and North American communities. The trees have to be well looked after, and they cannot be used to make syrup until the trunks reach a diameter of around 25 centimeters. This can take anything up to 40 years. As I've already mentioned, maple trees need the right conditions to grow and also to produce sap. Why is this? Well, what happens is that during a cold night, the tree absorbs water from the soil, 
and that rises through the tree's vascular system. But then, in the warmer daytime, the change in temperature causes the water to be pushed back down to the bottom of the tree. This continual movement, up and down, leads to the formation of the sap needed for maple syrup production. When the tree is ready, it can be tapped, and this involves drilling a small hole into the trunk and inserting a tube into it that ends in a bucket. The trees can often take several taps, though the workers take care not to cause any damage to the healthy growth of the tree itself. The sap that comes out of the trees consists of 98% water and 2% sugar and other nutrients. It has to be boiled so that much of that water evaporates. And this process has to take place immediately using what are called evaporators. These are basically extremely large pans. The sap is poured into these. A fire is built and the pans are then heated until the sap boils. As it does this, the water evaporates and the syrup begins to form. The evaporation process creates large quantities of steam and the sap becomes thicker and denser and at just the right moment when the sap is thick enough to be called maple syrup, the worker removes it from the heat. After this process, something called sugar sand has to be filtered out as this builds up during the boiling and gives the syrup a cloudy appearance and a slightly gritty taste. Once this has been done, the syrup is ready to be packaged so that it can be used for a whole variety of products. It takes 40 liters of sap to produce one liter of maple syrup, so you can get an idea of how much is needed. So that's the basic process. In places like Quebec, That is the end of part. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share, and also turn on the notification bell and turn to the answers. And Mark, hope you score a 10 over 10. I'll see you in the next listening practice test video. Bye.